ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿತ್ ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿ ಶಾಂತಿ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣೆ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿತ್ವರ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿತ್ವರ ವಕ್ತುಂ ಸುಬೋಧ ವೇದಾಂತ ಪ್ರವೃತ್ತೋ ಹ್ಯ ಬುಧೋಪ್ಯಹಂ ಕೃಪಯ ತಂ ವಂದೇ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಣೇಶಂ ಪುನಃ ಪುನಃ ವಂದೇ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಮೇ ಮಹಾಮತಿ ಸೀತಾ ಸೇತ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮ ಯಚ್ಚಂತು ಶುಭದಾಮತಿ ದೈವೀಹ್ಯೇಷಾಗುಣಾತ್ಮಿಕ ದೈವೀಹ್ಯೇಷಾಗುಣಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಪ್ರಭು ಮಾಯಾ ದುರತ್ಯಯ ಪ್ರಭು ಮಾಯಾ ದುರತ್ಯಯ ಅಹಂ ಮಮೇತಿ ರೂಪಾಸ ಅಹಂ ಮಮೇತಿ ರೂಪಾಸ ಮಿಥ್ಯಾ ಭೋಗ ಪ್ರಲೋಭಿ The Lord's Maya is divine. It is made of the three gunas, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas and is difficult to cross over. It expresses as I and mine and the craving for illusory material objects. Okay, our topic, our topic going on is the topic of Maya. Yeah, this topic we said is Maya. one it's a fundamental topic in our advait vedanta but also very confusing topic the reason it can be confusing is because this maya can be seen from so many different angles yeah and the re- the other reason it's very confusing is because maya itself exists beyond the intellect yeah so it is the cause of the intellect and being the cause of the intellect it is beyond the intellect therefore <clears throat> there are aspects of maya which will never be understood completely yeah there are some parts which are anirvachaniyam inexplicable however having said that we may not understand maya directly but we can understand and perceive the effects of maya the effects of maya can be seen yeah just like we said you can't see the river bed directly but when you see the river flowing you know what the nature you can infer what the nature of the river bed is which direction it depth various things okay so it's called inferring things but it's not direct perception okay so last week uh we said i think nine or 10 different ways that this maya can be seen and i'll just share that screen with you these are the different ways in which that maya oops where is it can be seen yeah one lord's power to create sustain and dissolve the world two it is divine the ev belongs to him but he is not dependent on it <clears throat> three trigunatmika made up of sattva rajas and tamas four indescribable beyond the intellect five known via its effects six illusion ah uh, which means it makes things appear not as they are 
Mm -hmm. They end up looking different. It does that. And now seven, eight, nine, and 10 is what we were going to explore today. Okay, <clears throat> so let us look at number seven. Seven is the concept of I and mine. Okay, this is, a, is coming from the verse, in the verse, aham mama iti rupa. In Sanskrit, the word aham means I, I. Mm -hmm. So, aham purushaha, I am a man. Yeah, aham stri, I am a woman. Aham adhyapakaha, I am teacher. Aham pita, I am father. Aham, the other word, mama. Mama means mine. This is mine. Mama putraha, my son. Hmm? <clears throat> Mama Ratha. <laughs> Ratha. Car in those days. Ratha. My chariot. Huh? So your Toyota chariot, your Mercedes chariot. Mama Ratha. Huh? <laughs> so Ratha. <laughs> Mama Gruham, my house. Yeah? <clears throat> Word for laptop is not there in Sanskrit, so it's a mama laptop only. <laughs> now, these two concepts, aham and mama, I and mine, these also are expressions of maya. Mm -hmm. Now, I say, why would aham be an expression of maya? Aham, I am something. The concept, I am something. That is Maya. If you say I am everything, that is not Maya. That is the truth. Ambra Masmi, I am infinite. So I am everything is truth. That's not Maya. Ambra Masmi, Ambra Masmi is not Maya. That is the truth. But I am this so and so, this particular thing. That is called Maya. Yeah. Aham aso. It's in Sanskrit. Aham aso. I am this. Yeah. Then that is called a Maya. So this is called identification. In English, we call identification. It's called tadatmiyam. I have taken myself to become something which I am not. I have taken myself as something which I am not. Tadatmiyam identification identification is born of maya yeah. we see this obviously very strongly uh, now today afl grand final afl grand final okay so now two teams are playing richmond and geelong i think richmond and geelong are playing so now if you are an avid football supporter and your team is in the final, so you're a Richmond, Richmond supporter. Yeah. Now, if that team is playing, huh? When they're playing, you're gonna say, We're winning, we're winning, if you're winning. <laughs> we're winning. Yeah. And if you're like, we're losing. Mm -hmm. Now we say we are winning, we are losing. That is because you have identified with that team. You sitting in another state are not winning or losing when a ball goes through the goal. Nothing happens to you. You don't get prize money. You don't get trophy. You don't get acknowledgement. No one. Even the captain is not going to thank you. Nothing. He will say. Yeah. <laughs> but the concept of I am winning, I am losing, when actually winning and losing is happening for someone else, not for me. It's happening for someone else. Yeah. This is called identification. We obviously have it even with family members. With family members, they go through some experience. You feel you're going through that experience. When children are going for exams, parents become anxious. Now, my parents become anxious when children are going for exams. <laughs> oh, 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 my child, I got an exam. <laughs> Swamiji, a bit of tension, a bit, bit stressed. The house is a bit stressful. All right? Your child is going for exam. Child is going for exam. I, I even met one couple once. 
and their, their daughter was doing VC. So for one year, they didn't come for the classes. And I saw them after one year. Now, prior to seeing them, the man had black hair. And I kid you not, in one year, his hair went gray. His hair went gray. And I said, what happened to this? And I asked him, what happened to you? We haven't seen you for 12, 12 months. What happened? He said, my daughter was doing it too. I was Swamiji. Very stressful, very stressful year. And I can clearly see it's stressful. Your old hair has gone gray only. Huh? Daughter smiling. She's quite happy. No problem, Swamiji. Year 12 was very easy, but my father was stressed. That is called tadatmium. You have identified with that person, and that I am that person going through this experience. You're not actually. They are going through their experience. So this false notion, superimposition, that I am going through what they're going through. <clears throat> their journey is my journey. No, they. Their journey is their journey. Your journey is your journey. But the notion that their journey is my journey, this is identification. Hmm? Identification. Then, born of this identification comes this concept of possessiveness. Yeah. Once the identification is there, then whatever is connected to that object you are identified with, you claim as your own. You claim as your own. Yeah? So if child gets good results, you feel, oh, we got good results. Hmm? No, child got good results. They belong to the ch child, not to you. Your results, we have to go back in time and have a look at your high school certificate. Then we'll find out your results. You know? We, <laughs> we don't know if they are so impressive. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. We don't know. <laughs> but, huh? Once I'm identified with that object, anything connected to that object, I relate to as mine. You know, mine. Once I'm connected to this body, I am this body, then anything connected to this body, mine. My family, my people, huh? mine. This is Arjuna had this problem in the start of the Gita. This is his problem. He had Tadatmiyam with the wrong people. He saw the enemy as his family. And he calls them, if you read Gita chapter 1, you'll see he uses words like swajanam. Swajanam, my own people. Yeah. Swabandava. Swabandava, my relatives. But actually there, he is a dharma yod. Dharma yod, warrior of dharma. Warrior of dharma hmm, only has his senapati. That's it. His general is the only person he should be following. Hmm? Senapati. Senapati for Pandavas, Drishta Jumna. That's it. If Senapati said you do this, you do this. You cannot look at the other people and say, Swajanam, Subandava. That's all identification. Incorrect. It happens to us a lot in all situations. We get confused because identity is not clear. Our role is not clear. Yeah? And so, clarity should always be on your identity. What is your identity? Now, of course, absolute identity, I am Brahman. That's what this is discussing. But even in relative terms, you have a relative identity. You are so-and-so. But don't confuse that with someone else. Don't confuse that with someone else. Yeah? That is important. You, like I said, you have your journey. They have their journey. And no matter who the person is, everyone's journey is their own journey. There's a golden rule. You cannot live another person's life. No matter who it is, your child, your wife, your son, whoever it is, your father, doesn't matter. You cannot live their life. Their life is their life. Yeah. So when this gets confused, we become very insistent with people. And then we say, you must do what I tell you to do. And they say, why? They say, See, I also made the same mistake when you were that age. That's why I'm trying to save you from making that mistake. That's why I'm telling you. They won't listen to me. Huh? Now, your father said the same thing to you, that he made that same mistake and he told you not to do it. And you said, no, huh? I have to live my life. Let me make the mistake and solve it for myself. 
huh? and then your child will say the same thing to you. This is my life. Let me make, I will make my own mistake and figure it out myself. That's their journey. Some people's journey will be, they will have to make that mistake. If they don't make that mistake, they will never learn. Nagging, 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 advising, 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 lecturing, 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 doesn't work. They will have to make that mistake. The reason we find it so intolerable is because of identification. Nothing else. Justify it all you want. Loss of money, loss of this, loss of that, inefficient, this, why they want to do this when I already tried, doesn't work. All this is incorrect justification. Bottom line is you are identified with the person, that's why you're suffering. Mm -hmm. If you're not identified with them, then okay. That's why you see, I tell you, the best people to give advice to children, who are the best people to give advice to children? Anyone who is not the parent of the child, that generally give good advice. Bring your friend in, and then he should have a chat with your son. And then he will say, okay, sounds interesting. He wants to go study abroad, maybe it can work. Yeah? You go and give that advice, you say, no, 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 why do you want to leave the family? No, no, it should stay with us only. Where, where is he going? Then if he goes, he may never come back. Well, no, 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 no. Huh? So all this will come in. Yeah? Friend will come and say, maybe. Huh? Your 18-year-old child got boyfriend, girlfriend. <gasps> no, no, no boyfriend, girlfriend. We never saw this boyfriend, girlfriend. And they say, you know, these things happen now. And then your friend comes and says, these things happen. Huh? Meet the boy, meet the girl. If they're nice people, it's okay. See what happens. You know, but for you, no, no, absolutely. Reaction. This reaction is called identification. Your friend does not have such identification with your child, therefore can see objectively. Yeah. This identification is Maya. This is Maya, expression of Maya. And the funny thing is, it happens without you even knowing it. You won't know you're identified with something until you become fixed on it. Until you realize that your fixation, your insistence, it was very hard to sense identification. It's very hard. You just don't know. Huh? It's only when that thing you're identified with does not do what you want it to do, then you realize there's a problem. Yeah? So sometimes identif identification is only recognized through its effects. Because when it actually takes place, it's so gentle and it's so subtle that you just didn't even realize it happened it happened now i'm identified with it yeah like if you never watch this football or anything like this or some sport yeah, you don't care for this and after some time you start feeling something when they score the point you say oh this is good you know and why this emotion is coming within you because over a period of time you've now become identified mm -hmm. very gentle and very subtle is its nature yeah so aham kalatmiyam is the subtlest form of expression of maya that's maya expressing it as subtlest how to pick up mama then is just the secondary result once you're identified with something then possessiveness over anything connected to it that's the secondary yeah so if you want to get to the cause of it the cause of it is in identification yeah the symptoms are in possessiveness. Possessiveness. Possessiveness is secondary. To manage possessiveness, we say learn to share. Learn to share. Yeah, when you share things, that's how you manage huh, and reduce the notion of possessiveness. But possessiveness will always be there as long as identification is there. Eventually, you have to remove identification. That has to be done by correct thinking. Vichar, only correct thinking. Atma vichar, who am I? Whether you ask it at an empirical level, whether you ask it at an absolute level, you always have to ask, who am I? Question must always be there. Yeah. So, this becomes... Now, recently, one, one young man was talking to me. He got a promotion. So now he's become like boss to his previous, you know, co-workers. Now that's a very awkward situation. 
because when you have a boss of people that you were previously working with, previously when you're working with them, you are friends, colleagues. So then you have a friendly rapport with them, you know? You both sit together in the coffee, in the coffee what? Uh, station, and then you gossip about the, the bosses and complain about them. Now you become the boss. <laughs> now, now all of a sudden, he's saying, oh, tricky thing is now, he wants to be friend, but he's finding that as a friend, the people are not doing the job he wants them to do. <laughs> you see? As a friend, there's no accountability. Well, amongst friends, there's no accountability. To your boss, you're accountable. But to your friend, you're not accountable. You say, oh. To your friend, you tell them how you stayed up late night watching tennis or something like that. And just this morning, you got up just 10 minutes put some water on your face and sat on the tube. That, that you tell your friend, you don't tell your boss that. The boss, you don't sit there and say that you were in bed 10 minutes prior to the work meeting. Huh? Your friend, you would tell. So now he has this, he going through interesting experience where he's saying, huh? I want to be friendly, but when I'm friendly, these people don't listen to what I have to say. <laughs> then I'm not respected as a boss. Hmm? But then if I become the boss, I lose my friendship. Yeah, and it's all about who am I? Who are you in that situation? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Do you want to be a friendly boss or a bossy friend? Which one? <laughs> See, I said a friendly boss is different to a bossy friend. Friendly boss, maybe boss first. Friendly is an adjective. Bossy friend, friend first. Bossy is the adjective. <laughs> you understand? It must be clear. So even at an empirical level, we must be very clear, who am I? That must always be understood, yeah? So these are subtle expressions of Maya, okay? Now, what is the next expression of Maya? We said this. Mm, aham, mama. Temptation for illusory objects. I'll tell you what, we'll take up number nine. Okay. Number nine is Maya expresses as obstacles. Obstacles. Okay. Now, briefly, I talked about it earlier, but now today we're going to do something different. Okay. Something different in our class. We are evolving and adapting the classes. Okay. So today we're going to do discussion group. Now, how many of us are there? 49 people. Okay. So now we've already organized this last three weeks. We've been thinking about this. We have allocated discussion group leaders. Okay. They're called facilitators. Your groups, you'll be now broken into groups of about seven people. I think. Yeah. Around seven. And in that group of seven, one person will be a facilitator. Okay. So when you start this group, the facilitator should tell everyone they're the facilitator. They've all been allocated and they've been trained as well, okay? We've then come up with discussion group questions for today, okay? And now you will have, we'll give you 15 minutes in that group to discuss these questions. Your facilitator will take down the notes, yeah? And then at the end, only two facilitators will present to the group, okay? because otherwise it would go on forever. There's going to be seven groups. It will take too long. Other responses will be sent via email to me at some point in time. Okay? So the questions that we have, now again, your facilitator will have these questions. Now questions you'll have, <clears throat> with what attitude should one see obstacles? With what attitude should one see obstacles? In turn, how do we overcome obstacles? How do we overcome obstacles? So that's one A, one B, then two. So that's one and two, you can say. Then number three, how do we see obstacles not as obstacles? Okay, how do you see obstacles not as obstacles? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Three questions are there, okay? So now Varun is there. He will somehow drink magically push you all into groups. 
Now, if you're not happy with your group, blame Varun, okay? You can, I'm not taking any responsibility for this. It's random allocation, actually, okay? It's random allocation, but every group will have a facilitator. First thing I only ask is facilitators, please tell your group you are the facilitator. Otherwise, they will think you are being a bossy participant rather than a friendly facilitator, okay? So <laughs> please tell them that. <laughs> Yeah, and now you get 15 minutes. It's 11.28, let's say 11.45. The thing will, will stop there. Yeah, okay, I'll leave it with you. I'm not part of the group. How do you? Okay, then uh, what we'll do now, I'm just going to ask two facilitators to present so that we don't get overworked. I think seven groups or eight groups are there. If everyone does it, it'll take a long time. But two of you and Ajay and Santosh today, right? You guys will present. So Ajay, where are you? You can present the points. Well, there was um, uh, Hario. Yeah. There were three questions, but then uh, because they these three questions are interconnected, yeah. the answers are not exactly as per the question. Yeah. So I just read it out what we have noted. The attitude should be um, this is not part of us to answer the first question. With what attitude? This is, this is not. Question. This is not, it's not, it's not part of us. Not so we, part of us. Okay. Yeah. So there's something which is external and okay. we have to do uh, what we have to do to get through it. Okay. Uh, initially, we tend to be frustrated that our plans are blocked. But yeah. How quickly we can adapt to the new situation because our mind is, our mind will tend to quickly calculate our strength and the resources that we have and the challenge ahead. So yeah. seeing that, we should adapt, and if we have to upskill ourselves to overcome the uh, obstacle, we should do that. The third one is obstacles are not tragedy, so it's obstacle is more about a challenge to be taken, and how I can grow from it. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, approach an obstacle and think about what I can learn from that obstacle. Like if yeah. I, yeah, if I am a calm person and if a difficult situation comes to me, am I still calm or am I losing it? Losing yeah. it. So that's something which we can check internally and see if I can, if there is a scope to, for growth. Okay. Um, another point was obstacles. We see something as an obstacle because there is a weakness in us. Okay. If we had the skill and ability to encounter that uh, the obstacle, we wouldn't see that as an obstacle. We will just manage it and go. Yeah. Because there is a gap within us, we see it as an. We term it as an obstacle. And uh, the other one was stay calm, respond to it rather than react to it. Uh, treat it differently. Expectation uh, versus encounter. Yep, I've done that. The other uh, coming to the second question: How to overcome obstacle? Yeah. Again, I probably have partly covered in it, but they were more yeah. more important. Be like water, where, where there is an obstacle, either go around it or go over it or crush your obstacle and continue. But take <laughs> water as an example. Um, the attitude, the way you look at it, uh, will always be there will always be some weakness. So focus more on the internal. When there is an obstacle, instead of yeah. seeing that object as an external obstacle, see what's the changes which is happening internal. Yeah. Am I still calm? Am I losing the pot? Kind of. That's another thing. Uh, there is uh, the last two points are with every obstacle, there is an opportunity. Yeah. That, yeah if there is an opportunity. So probably we have to identify that opportunity rather than seeing it as an obstacle. And the last point is every everything is an experience. Even your obstacle is an experience. What we term as an obstacle is also an experience. So to treat it as an experience and don't don't dramatize it too much as an obstacle. Okay. Okay. Nice. That's that's it. Good. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Uh, and then Santosh. Are you on I guess a quick feedback to say that discussion group worked really well, uh, as in the allocation. Uh, uh, the first question about the attitude. Uh, I think uh, positive light. Uh, we see this as an opportunity. Um, it helps us grow. Uh, 
it is a learning experience um, and we don't bring in self-pity um, and uh, how do we overcome the obstacles uh, I guess a sense of non-attachment um, and we adapt to situations like weather uh, you know we're not always complaining about weather um, we also take this as prarabdha karma was one of the points um, and um, someone said even this shall pass like you know what Gurudev actually says um, and uh, how to see obstacles as not obstacles um, look at it objectively um, COVID was one of the examples uh, and see how we can actually make positive use of it uh, changing the behavioral pattern when we have obstacles uh, I think similar to what Ajay said or Ajay's group said about flowing water um, and uh, trust in God yeah was one of the uh, points mentioned and yeah look I think I think yeah that was pretty much the summary of those questions okay thanks okay, okay good uh, yeah we'll leave it at that uh, in, in terms of sharing from others I'm sure other groups might have other things as well but uh, they can be emailed to me we can look at them um, look, good points, very good points. So if we look at uh, the questions, uh, what attitude? So I think, yes, take it an attitude of growth, seize an opportunity. Um, I, liked, uh, I, liked, I liked some of the change in language. I think this was important. That last question, how to see obstacles, not as obstacles. What this involves is changing your language, yeah? Our vision of life, our experience of life is dependent on our vision. Our vision is dependent upon our thoughts. Our thoughts are dependent upon language, okay? Everything comes down to language, yeah? Because all our thoughts are formed in language. So it's about changing our language. If the word obstacle to you, you have to see how you personally connect with that word. Some people don't like that word. Yeah. So if you don't like the word obstacle, you need to find a new word. When you find a new word, then all of a sudden you have a different way of looking at it. Now, words that came up today, I heard were opportunity. Okay. Rather than obstacle, opportunity. Another one which I liked, experience. It's just an experience. Don't call it an obstacle, just call it, I think that's a very good word, experience. I like that. Yeah. Um, these two words, I mean, there are others as well that you can use. And you can come up with your own things. But I think these two words are, are, are methods in which you start changing your vision. In, uh, in, in scientific terms, therapy terms, it's called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And all they do is they change words that you already have a bad association with. They change them so you have a positive association. Now, maybe you want a bad association with the word obstacle. It may sound overwhelming. It may sound insurmountable. It may sound as if it cannot be, you cannot overcome it in any way. Now you change it, yeah? Obstacle is just another one of life's experience. So it's just a thing we all, we all have to go through. All of a sudden, it takes away the power from that event. This is just an event. You don't need to see it as an obstacle if you're not comfortable with the word obstacle. It's just an event that's taking place. All of a sudden, that thing called obstacle has lost a lot of its power. Yeah, it doesn't seem insurmountable because events are not insurmountable. Experiences are not insurmountable. They're just things that come and go. 
Yeah? There are things that come and go. An obstacle feels like something you have to climb, like a Mount Everest. And then it seems like a big job to do this tiring, exhausting, long, drawn out. So, you know, that can be, you might feel deterred by that thought. So change that language. So I like that word. Oh, this is just an experience. I found another way that I have looked at obstacles is catalyst to enhancement. <laughs> catalyst to enhancement. A catalyst is something which speeds a reaction up. That's what a catalyst is. It speeds things up. Yeah? Enhancement me oh, to your betterment. A catalyst to you becoming better. Yeah? Now, as I explain this, a lot of these things will come into, uh, you'll understand them. Now, one of the things that Vedanta, how Vedanta looks at things called obstacles, is that yes, from the highest standpoint, we take the standpoint that the outer world is a reflection of what is happening within us. Our inner mindset is reflected as the world outside. Now the reflection kind of becomes like an inversion. Like when you see a reflection in a mirror, the general form is the same, but the whole thing is inverted. Left is right, right is left. Yeah. So in this reflection slash inversion, what happens is inner, now it came up in our talks, inner weaknesses or gaps in our own personality are reflected outside as outer faults and problems. Outer faults and problems. Outer faults mean faults with other people, faults with the world, yeah, or problems with the world. But actually, all that's happening is an inner weakness is being reflected outside, and inner weakness outside is seen as outer problems yeah gurudev would say inner confusion outer conflict that's how he would say it. inner confusion outer conflict is it inner weakness or insecurity outer faults and problems yeah this is how vedanta looks at life okay now what is the mirror in between what is this gap inner to outer? This barrier is called ego. Yeah? The barrier is called the ego. Anything on the inside of the ego is called inner. And when it's inside the ego, we generally are blind to it. Generally, we're blind to anything on inside of the ego because it requires a high level of self-analysis. It requires a very introverted attention, which generally we don't, naturally we don't have. Naturally, our attention is external. Yeah. Outside of the ego, external world. Outside of ego is called world. Inside of ego, me. Me and world. The barrier is called this ego. Now, if I give you some examples, right? Now, while you were doing that, I was putting together this slide. Let's have a quick look at this. And this is how it is. Okay, now if I show this, or this. Now just rough, I've put up a few things here. Obstacles, inner gap or weakness, outer problems. Yeah, the barrier, ego. Now let's just say, or let's, let's look at the outer problem. The outer problem is always easier to see. The outer problem is that, okay, People keep distancing themselves from me. People want to get away from me. Let's just say that's me. Yeah. <laughs> People avoid me when I want to talk to them. They say they don't have time. Yeah. Sometimes they happen when you talk to your adult children. They're always like, we're too busy. We're too busy. We don't have time. Yeah. So aging parents always feel this. No one wants to talk to me. Yeah. 
Now, people avoiding me, distancing me from me. Yeah. One of the inner situations you might have is that you might have a dependence upon that person. Yeah. You might be clingy, very dependent, needy. And so that person in that relationship is not very comfortable. And so when you deal with people that are very needy or dependent, then the reaction of the world is run away. We want to get away from it. We find it hard to deal with. It's a bit stifling. It's very stifling. Yeah? So what one person is seeing is, why is everyone running away from me? Why does everyone avoid me? Why do these people don't spend any time with me? And then sometimes we look at these people, we look at our children, and we say, you people have no respect. We say, you don't care for us. We, you know, we can get into this blame cycle about their behavior and their attitude and all that. But sometimes it is stemming from a fact that I have got a high level of dependence. I'm very emotionally dependent on this relationship. And that is now expressing, reflecting outside in the form of people not being comfortable with me and therefore wanting to distance themselves. Yeah? That's an example. Now, another example. In my life, other people make decisions for me. I never get to make decisions. Everyone else decides and tells me what to do. Yeah, when I was a child, my parents told me what to do. When I got married, my spouse told me what to do. And now I have children, they tell me what to do. Everyone keeps telling me what to do with my life. Why is it like that? Why is it like everyone is, feels that they can look at my face and then tell me what I'm supposed to do with my life? This can be stemming from inner lack of clarity. That when people talk to you, when they ask you questions, you don't seem to have much clear direction as to what you want to do. You don't seem to express any aspirations. You don't seem to have any direction. Now, even as an adult, this is a big challenge. <laughs> yeah? Such so a simple thing. Like you do, I mean, it can, it can be from the most basic things, such as what do you want to eat? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do today? And if you're the person that, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. If everything you come back with is an I don't know, you're going to find other people are going to start making plans for you. Yeah? If you don't have an idea of what you want to do with the day, other people will say, we're going to make plans for you about the day. And they'll get frustrated because they'll say, we always have to plan everything because you don't plan anything. Hmm? So you get into this relationship where other people just become comfortable making decisions for you because you are not confident in making decisions. Lack of clarity and things. Another one, you might find other people nag you, keep telling you what to do. And that could be lack of motivation. You might have a plan, but you never execute it. So you keep on talking about that beautiful garden that you want to create. But every weekend, nothing happens to that garden. No changes take place. The garden looks exactly as, actually it gets worse because the grass keeps growing out of control. So it only gets worse. But then people around you keep on telling you, when are you going to get that grass done? When are you going to do this? When are you going to put that in? When are you going to fix this thing? You keep talking about it, but you never do it. And you find everyone keeps nagging, nagging, nagging. Why are they nagging? Because I lack motivation. When I lack motivation, other people have to motivate me. Yeah? It could be food habits, lifestyle habits, exercise habits, all this. I lack, I might know what I want to do, but I lack motivation to implement it. That expresses in the form of lots of people around you nagging you, yeah, prompting you, pushing you, harassing you. <laughs> yeah. In 20 years' time, we can call it children's harassment. So children are harassing you about what to do. <laughs> Bullying in the house <laughs> with children. Now, you might find a lot of people disagree with you. Hmm? Why every time I say something, everyone just immediately just disagrees with me. There's no discussion. Actually, they just shut me down straight away. Before I can even complete the sentence from my mouth, no. No. People already said no. You might wonder why that is happening. That because... Inner rigidity, very fixed opinions. A person got very fixed opinions about things. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. The fact that you are, you cannot be moved 
in your viewpoint, that becomes problematic for people because they feel there is no way to have a discussion here. So there's no opportunity to discuss. It's basically my way or the highway. And therefore, without considering what you have to say, people immediately, no, disagree. This is very common. You see this in, you know, obviously long-term relationships of people immediately just disagree with certain ideas which come out. And it's got nothing to do with the idea. It's the person it's coming from. If the same idea is given from another person, they'll accept it. It happens all the time because people invite me to their house and they ask me to do this. They ask, they say, Swamiji, what do you think about this? And when I say that, then their spouse says, oh, that's a good idea. And then the other person says, I've been telling them for 20 years to do that, but they won't do it. But now that you have come, Swamiji, good. So these things happen. <laughs> which shows it's got nothing to do with the idea. It is the person it's coming from. Yeah. Now, these are just examples. Yeah. Now, as we get older, every generation says the same thing about the, old, the previous, the younger generations. They, they don't have enough respect. They spend too much time in technology. They're very distracted. Everyone says the same thing. Don't worry. Your parents said the same thing about you. You are saying the same thing about your children spend too much time on computers. Don't worry, they said the same thing about us. Yeah, we had the little computer games. They were just really bad in those days. But even when we had them, they said, you spend too much time, go outside, run around. Then if you run around too much, they say, all you do is run around the whole day. When are you going to study? Every generation is going to complain about younger generation, okay? So if you find that you are now in this situation when you get together and you just complain about younger generation and millennials, you use the word millennials a lot, you better be careful. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the issue you can have there is the lack of adaptability. Yeah. Lack of adaptability. And it all happens as we get older, lack of adaptability. We can't adapt to things. Yeah. So every time we look at young people, we just keep on finding faults. Hmm? Whole time in front of computers, whole time in front of, always on their phones, talking to their friends. Yeah. So lack of adaptability then comes out in mm -hmm, complaining about any change which goes on. Yeah. Now, this is what we're doing here is you're just correlating now. Let's look at what's called the obstacle, the outer problem, and let's just call it an experience. And why am I having this experience? Vedanta says every experience you are having is just a reflection of your mindset. Yeah. So now I should trace that experience back to a mindset pattern. And now I can work on it. Yeah. Now you came up with a good point here. One of the most important points, the biggest challenge when doing this type of sadhana is falling into self-pity. Because when you keep looking at these things, oh, there's so many problems with me. That's why everyone runs away. Yeah, so you get caught in self-pity. I'm a terrible person. I'm a useless person. I can't do this. I can't do that. Can't be self-pity. Now, the first response you gave was a very nice one. This is not a part of me. Yeah, that was the first answer somebody gave it. This, how to look at it. This is not a part of me. Yeah, so when you see outer problems coming from inner mindset please understand even that inner mindset that mind is not you the mind is an instrument the instrument has got various huh faults or weaknesses or needs adjustments it needs adjustments it's, it needs a tune-up like your car needs to go to a mechanic yeah. And so if you look at it, that this is a problem with my mind, not a problem with me. Just who am I? I am pure consciousness. As pure consciousness, I am perfect. Everyone here is perfect. Only as pure consciousness. Not as body, mind, intellect. Okay, don't walk out of this class and claim to the rest of your family. 
I am perfect. Swamiji has said so. Nothing doing. As pure consciousness, you are perfect. Body, mind, intellect, all of us are flawed, riddled with problems. Yeah? Defective personality, speaker included. Okay? I'm not even... <laughs> so, now if I look at it, because of this mind and its weaknesses, setbacks, therefore I am having this experience of the world. My experience of the world is coming out of the projection of my mind. Now, why don't I use this opportunity now to change that? So when the experience becomes so unpleasant, it now shows it is time to fix that mind. You know, like this, especially when you have an old car. People drive old cars and then they don't take them to a lot of regular servicing. When do we take them for servicing? When some noise gets really out of control and it's so loud that you're like, now this is a real problem. Yeah? But initially when you drive that car, a little bit of background noise, it comes, goes, comes, goes, sometimes there, sometimes not there. You just keep driving the car. You don't get it checked out. But when that uh, noise becomes so loud and problematic, then you say, now that's it. We're going to take this car for servicing. Isn't it? Same way. We sometimes have little outside frustrations, outside skirmishes, outside annoyances. Come go, come go. We don't do any checkup. We don't take it into mechanics. We don't sit there and change things. Because we're like, we can still function. Things are going on. That's why we don't change. Then all of a sudden, big collapse, big fight, big problems. Yeah, loud noises. Then you say, okay, stop the car. We need to now send it for servicing. Now I have, when I service it, what do I have to do? Open the bonnet. Look under the hood. And check out what is going within. That's what a mechanic does. Now you have to be your own mechanic. Yeah? When you have a big problem in life, you have to sit down and open your bonnet. Pop the hood. Yeah? And you have to look at what is going on under the bonnet. Now Gurudev has a talk called Under the Bonnet. We exactly use this analogy. Yeah? Pop the hood, have a look what's happening. Check your body, mind, intellect dials. Overheated, yeah? <laughs> sometimes overheated, sometimes no fuel, no motivation, yeah? Sometimes conveyor belt. When fan belt is gone. When fan belt is broken, you have no fans left. No one is your fan in this world. No one likes you. <laughs> New fan belt, so you get some fans. People should like you. So you have to look at these type of things. And this is why I say the outer problems, the bigger they are, they become a stronger catalyst for change. Yeah, that's why I use the word catalyst. It's always there. We should change. But sometimes we need a very strong, intimidating, upsetting, unpleasant event to prompt us to now Stop this vehicle and look underneath the hood. Because unless that massive incident doesn't take place, we still think we can get away with it. We can just keep driving this thing. And you are driving it, but problem, problem, the way some noise is going. And so this is how Vedanta looks at obstacles. It says everything outside is actually just reflection of what is happening within me. There's an inner insecurity, an inner weakness that is there. And that only is manifesting as this outer irritation or problem. Therefore, use this problem as an opportunity to stop your vehicle. Introspect. Mm -hmm. Find out what is the possible problem going on within. Don't fall into 
the trap of self-pity because remember you're tuning the instrument when the car is not working that doesn't mean the driver is faulty the car is faulty the engine is faulty the driver is not faulty same way mind may need a tune up consciousness is perfectly fine you as consciousness perfectly fine mind needs a tune up yeah we all need this tune up it's very essential yeah that's why we should all take a break from the routine and we have to do satsang and at the end of the year you have to sit down and do like a nice type of satsang camp that's the idea that's you going into the service shop for your annual tune up yeah weekly classes are just putting a bit of water and oil every week Okay, a little bit of water on. But every now you have to go see the mechanic. Yeah. And you have to stop everything and he's got to open the hood and then do, 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 and take a few things out, put a few new things in. And then ready for the whole year to go. Okay. So this is how you can look at it. But I think you've all got the point. Nice points came up here. And like I said, one of the methods obviously is that we need to distance or separate ourselves from the actual, whether we say event outside or inner weakness. And I think you come up with a nice language that one, the event outside is just an experience. That's it. And when you look on the inside, you say, this is not a part of me. Yeah. This is not me. This is happening to the mind only. The mind just needs a bit of changing. Like now you wear glasses, you go outside and because the glasses have got dirt on them, the world looks dirty, smudged and blurry. Clean the glasses. Nothing wrong with your eyes. Just clean the glasses. Same way. That's how you can look at it. So this is how we can handle obstacles. Maya makes you believe the problem is with the world. That's what Maya does. It makes you believe the problem is with the world, and therefore we invest all our effort in changing that world. We spend all our time trying to change, correct, manipulate, control, dominate, govern the world. That's what Maya does. Yeah. And that's why I said Maya can appear as obstacles. Okay. Okay. Now only one more topic to go. That was the temptations and things like that. That we can see next week. And then we then have to get into how to overcome Maya. <laughs> We've now understood Maya. How do we overcome this Maya? So nice verses right there. Okay. This week, try this sadhana. You make those two lists: external problem, internal gap, and try to relate the two. What are the things that irritate you outside? And try to find how they are connected to some adjustment that needs to be made within you. Okay. See if you can try that. Oh. Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om